The entrance door had been pushed wide, and a man stood in the space, two others behind him. Lee Ainsley was a good reporter, but as a detective, he sure had a system all his own. You're listening to Pulp Reader. But first, free offer for false teeth. Here's new amazing mouth comfort without risking a single cent. Enjoy that feeling of having your own teeth again. Satisfy your desire for food. Eat what you want. Crown Reliner tightens false teeth or no cost. Perfect for partials, lowers, and uppers. Tightens false teeth or no cost. Crown Dental Plate Reliner is not a powder or a paste. It is a scientific discovery that you use without fuss or bother. Just squeeze it out of the tube onto the plate and in a jiffy, your plate will again feel as tight and comfortable as it did when it was new. Doesn't burn or irritate. Order today and enjoy this new oral comfort right away. Send no money. Crown Plastic Corporation, Department 3403, 4358 West Philadelphia Avenue, Detroit, Michigan, USA. And now, on with the show. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in again. This is Bobby. You're listening to Pulp Reader. So there was a little bit of a delay between episodes. I'm trying to get better, but, you know, slowly but surely, I suppose. That's what they say. Uh, I'm trying to build some infrastructure around the show. Uh, We got a YouTube channel, so you can go to YouTube and type in Pulp Reader, and it'll have all the episodes up there on YouTube. Eventually, there's one so far, but the rest will get up there. Uh, Anyway... For those of you who are new here, the way this works is I grab a story from the public domain, from the old pulp magazines of decades past, and I read it. Today's story is from Secret Agent X Magazine, November 1934. It's written by Richard L. Hobart, and it's titled, Written in Blood. Lee Ainsley legged his way a bit uncertainly over to the sloppy bar. Little puddles of water covered its surface and made the red mahogany stain shine and reflect the lights of the back bar. Sloppiest bar in town, Lee told himself as he hunted for a dry spot on which his elbow might be allowed to rest so as to steady his slightly weaving body. Finally, he found it, let his elbow and forearm rest on the bar, and looked down its gleaming surface for the barkeep, Charlie Meeks. Hey, Charlie, he called. A half and half and don't snooze over it. In other words, I crave service. My head's muggy, my throat's dry, and I'm broke as the common people. In words of one syllable, dearie, this drinks on the house. Charlie sniffed, but reached for the proper containers and the correct ingredients. He threw the cocktail together with pre-war dexterity, placed the glass on the wet mahogany bar, and slid it a good ten feet until it stopped directly in line with Lee's elbow. What I calls accuracy, said Lee, and sipped of the drink gratefully. He added, and potency. He smacked his lips. "'You should not to come here, Lee,' chided Charlie seriously, eyes wrinkled with worry lines. "'You ought to know that Greasy Nordley has got the Indian sign out on you. "'He said only yesterday that it was curtains for you when he got you. "'You ought to know that Greasy is—' "'Ah, Bronx cheer for the punk,' said Lee carelessly. "'He downed the last sip of his half and half, and then his lips made a sound, "'an expert rendition of the Bronx Raz. "'But you'd ought to—' began Charlie ominously. Lee shoved himself back from the bar, surveyed Charlie through critical eyes. He said, "'Charlie, when the hell are you going to quit murdering the New Deal's English? You ain't never going to learn nothing anyway. You ought to be smart like I am, Charlie. Of course, I haven't any money, but I got something just as good. What, I can hear you say, does the little man mean by that? Well, Charlie, I'll tell you. I have no money, but I do have something worth money. A real diamond pin, my boy. A real diamond.' Charlie sighed as Lee's fingers sought his tie and came away with the stick pin of filigreed white gold in which reposed a single diamond of modest size. Lee laid the pin before him on the wet bar. Even a pawnbroker will let me have a ten spot on it, Charlie. You let me have a sawbuck and I'll buy some drinks. Come payday, I'll return and take it up and you'll have done your good deed for the wee boy scout. Do we trade? Charlie sighed again. Ah, take a couple of drinks and pay me when you got the jack, he suggested. The diamond pin was Lee's last resort for a drink. Charlie had it half the time when it wasn't in the till of some cafe and knew there was no way of refusing to lend the newspaper man the money. He reached for the pin. Suddenly he stopped the movement of his arm and Lee looked up into Charlie's face. What he saw made him stiffen and his eyes went over Charlie's shoulder to the mirror of the back bar. In the back bar mirror was framed the entrance door thirty feet away. 
It had been pushed wide open and a man stood in the space, two others behind him. It was Greasy Nordley. I told you, kid, I told you, hissed Charlie and casually began wiping his way down the bar, working steadily away from Lee. A small clock inset in the wood of the back bar showed 2.30 in the morning. Greasy Nordley, framed in the mirror, stood talking to his men. Lee could see his lips move even at that distance. Lee said, voice steady, A whiskey straight, Charlie. Make it snappy. It may be the last one I'll ever have. Lee's fingers reached forward a bit and curled around the diamond stick pin where Charlie had dropped it upon the entrance of Greasy Nordley and his men. Greasy's men were walking around the place. Greasy eyed them expectantly. They prowled through the washrooms, stock rooms, and the kitchen. They nodded to Greasy. Charlie and Lee were alone. Greasy smiled malevolently. Charlie slid a whiskey glass brimming with Canadian club to Lee and poured a nip for himself. Charlie sidled away again, clinked bottles together on the back bar in an assiduous effort to appear occupied. There was a tight grin on Lee's face as he jabbed the diamond pin slantingly into the mahogany bar top. He sipped his whiskey until there was a rustle at his side. He turned slowly, saw Greasy Nordley backed by the two men up close. Something pressed gently into his side. "'I've been looking for you.' said Greasy nastily. "'Yeah, and what of it, punk?' asked Lee quietly, his eyes slits of baleful fire. The other's eyes became vengeful pools of narrowed flame at the words. His arms were folded loosely across his chest, and Lee could see the slight bulge under the left arm which told of the easily reached gat. Lee was very quiet, and the half-full whiskey glass in his hand was as steady as the eyes which arrowed into those of Greasy Nordley. "'Guess you'd better come with me,' said Greasy." Then he added, As a newspaper man, you're about ripe for pickin'. Greasy's head jerked signals to the men behind him. They came forward, one on either side of Lee. You put too many cute things in that trick column of yours, suggested Greasy. I get paid for that, said Lee and held the whiskey glass to his lips. Yeah, you'll get paid all right, but you won't have much use for money after tonight, sneered Greasy. I'm petrified, punk. Greasy's hand flicked out and knocked the whiskey glass from Lee's hand. He stepped back a half-step, swung his right as he came forward on his toes, and his brown fist smacked against Lee's jaw. Lee went back into his right. His head cracked against the top rail of the bar, clattered against a brass cuspider in falling, and then smacked against the inlaid linoleum. He twitched once and lay still. Lee regained consciousness to the tune of little imps beating a tattoo against the inside of his skull with tiny trip hammers. He groaned, turned flat on his back, stretched, yawned, and then raised his hands to his head. Pain ebbed and flowed billowingly. He felt as if he were riding in the pain-racked jerks on a sea of torture. Finally the pain jabs lessened and he shook his head slowly to clear away the cobwebs. He was able to navigate fairly true when he struggled to his feet. A water basin of corroded metal in the corner had a single faucet and Lee filled the dirty bowl and ducked his head into it repeatedly. He felt better now, reached for a cigarette, and found two-thirds of a package in his pocket. He puffed gratefully. He smoked, thinking, until the cigarette tasted hot and acrid to his lips, and he fired a fresh one abstractly. Of course, there was hardly a chance, but... The room was small, roughly plastered. There was a small bed and a dresser with half the mirror gone. A cobwebby Mazda threw uncertain light. A window heavily barred with thick wire mesh was to the far side of the bed. Lee inspected it and discovered a red brick wall within twelve inches. Escape that way was impossible. Damn it, Lee said tonelessly and flipped his cigarette away. There was the sound of a padlock being unfastened outside. The door opened and Greasy Nordley entered. He was grinning ghoulishly. His gat was handy. Picture of a newspaper man at the end of his rope, he said in a rare good humor. Lee saw the safety guard of the gat was wide open. That's strange, said Lee evenly when a rope would fit your neck so nicely. Greasy flushed a gleam of hatred stabbed from his black pools of eyes. Go ahead, he taunted. Why is crack like you do in that lousy column of yours? It'll be easy to fill that job of yours after you're gone. Wonder who they'll put on the column after tomorrow. I'm worried to death about it, returned Lee and reached for another smoke. Then he added, I'll still be at the old stand. Yeah, but in a casket... You write too much in that column of yours, and you tell too many things. But no more, see, you know too much. Like that Pulaski killing, for instance, eh? Lee grinned tauntingly into Greasy's face. The man paled. Suddenly he nodded. Yeah, like the Pulaski killing, he said, 
and his voice was ominously low. A thought came to Lee. Where's Charlie? Greasy grinned. Ah, oh, he's seen too much. Guess he'll have to ten bar in hell for a time. Lee nodded. I see. Old Charlie gets a ride too, eh? Nice guy you are, Greaseball. You're not even a decent hood. Greasy's fingers tightened around the automatic. Lee laughed. You wouldn't use that if you knew what I'd do. Say, Greaseball, do you know what my paper's doing right now? I don't get you, snarled Greasy. You will in a minute. Well, I'll tell you. The city editor is working on headlines, Greasy. Headlines. They probably read something like, Famous columnist kidnapped. Greasy Nordley, known as the kidnapper. Police dragnet out. Nordley will be captured soon, say police. How do they sound? Greasy laughed, but there was a note of nervous shrillness in it. You make me laugh, he said. Yeah, you'll laugh all right. And punk? Lee's voice took on a deadly seriousness, which was not lost on Greasy. Those headlines will be written in red. Get me? Written in red. What, what, what do you mean? faltered Greasy, face working. Lee continued. After the headlines are written, they send them to the composing room, Greasy. The linotype machines are as complicated as hell, but it isn't long before the story comes out in hot metal, and I can just read it now, Greaseball. It'll go about like this. Hundreds of police and detectives are looking for Greasy Nordley, a cheap hood who thinks he's a big shot. At an early hour this morning, Nordley and two of his men kidnap Lee Ainsley, famed columnist of the Star, and Charlie Meeks, owner of a cafe. It is known that Lee Ainsley and Charlie Meeks are being held captive by Nordley and his men because the former printed thinly veiled innuendos. That's a ten-dollar word for you, Greasy. Saying that Nordley was soon to be questioned regarding the Pulaski murder mystery of a fortnight ago. It is set on most reliable information that Nordley will be in the hands of police before noon today. How's it sound, punk? Lee laughingly taunted. Greasy winced. Smart guy, he says. Well, just for that, you go out now. There was a sound of running steps in the hallway outside. A man rushed into the room, and his hand was a newspaper with screaming headlines. Headlines painted in red. Look, boss, he panted. The paper is full of this kidnapping. How the hell they'd find out about it? We'd better land before the cops. Greasy snatched the newspaper from the man's hand. Lee saw it was the star and grinned. Star's famous columnist missing. Kidnapped by Greasy Nordley. Cafe proprietor also taken. Police dragnet thrown wide. Capture of Nordley expected quickly. How'd they get this? screamed Greasy, and his face was chalk white. His fingers around the automatic were trembling, and the gun was shaking and weaving. There was the sudden hell of an inferno from below. A riot gun stuttered, punctuated by the blast from police specials. A door crashed, and there were sounds of yells, trampling feet, a body smacked against the floor. Lee grinned, and there was excitement on his face now. Called the turn, didn't I, Greaseball? Greasy Nordley screamed and jerked his gun higher to Lee's middle. His fingers contracted tremblingly, but Lee's fist caught him under the chin and the shot pinged against the wire mesh of the window. Lee dove and his shoulder caught the Greaseball's solar. Greasy slammed against the plaster with his head and squirmed over the floor. His face smashed. Sounds came closer. There was the wham of a single shot, and the man in the door doubled up and hit the floor head first, coughing. Hello, Griggs, said Lee, panting. A broad patrolman barged in, gun ready. He grinned at Lee. Lo, Lee, you're a hell of a lot of trouble. Yeah, but looky, you get your name in the column for this, Flatfoot. Gee, in your column, Mr. Ainsley? There was awe on the cop's face, and he grinned again. Detectives filled the small room. Lee shook hands with Detective Hobbs, in charge. Charlie, the barkeep, crowded in and shook, too. "'Pretty good work, Lee,' complimented Hobbs and looked at Greasy. "'I'll give the credit to Griggs. He earned it. "'I always did like a guy who reads my column,' Lee grinned. "'Yeah,' said Griggs. "'I copied it down on this piece of paper. Here it is.' He read slowly from the paper taken from his pocket. "'Greasy N. Got us. On spot. Search ends places. Hurry. Lee Ainsley.' You're a good cop, Griggs, said Lee, and I'm going to run your name in big caps tomorrow. Griggs grinned. Say, Griggs, asked Lee, when did you get that message? About three, I guess it was. I was trying doors and saw that Charlie's place was wide open, went in and couldn't see a soul, walked over to the bar and saw something glittering like a beacon light, looked closer and I saw the writing on the bar. We'd heard Greasy had it in for you, and of course, he had to snatch Charlie, too, because he knew too much about your kidnapping. 
I got busy then. Good boy, said Lee again and reached for a cigarette. The patrolman, Griggs, reached behind the flap of his coat and handed something to Lee. By the way, Mr. Ainsley, he said, here's that diamond stick pin of yours you used to scratch the message on the red paint of Charlie's bar. Sure don't see how you had a chance to write it. Lee said, I sure had to work fast. Thought Greasy saw me writing it for a minute, but I got away with it. Don't see how you read it anyway, he grinned. I always said that pin was worth more than ten bucks. The End And so that's the end of the story. That wraps up Written in Blood. Who'd have thought that diamond pin would have come in so handy? It's almost like they planted it right at the beginning of the story. Anyway, that's the episode for this week. Uh, you know, this is probably going to be the last episode for the year. Uh, how about this for 2019? I will try to get these episodes out much faster and more regularly. Uh, for those of you listening, hey, I really appreciate it. And for those of you who have left the reviews on iTunes, again, means a lot to me. So until then, keep listening. Feel free to share with your friends or just keep enjoying the show. It's, it's, all, it's all good to me. Uh, we'll see you next time. Happy holidays and we'll see you in 2019. Thanks. Bye.